Hello everyone and welcome to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce and today we're doing another Indie Horror Spotlight. I have back with us again, David Axe. He has a new movie out that I just got done seeing and it is a fun ride. Give it a 10 out of 10, oh, by the way. And it's called Acorn. David, welcome back to the Horror Room. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure, man. It's a pleasure. And I also have with us Sarah. Sarah is the director mm -hmm. of the the documentary of Acorn is called Create or Die. Sarah, welcome to the Horror Realm. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure. So, David, I'm going to shoot to you first. And yeah. This might be a, a tough question. Explain to my audience Acorn. <laughs> All right. So, uh, <laughs> Acorn is a, a movie. Uh, it's a movie about a movie about a movie about itself. Uh, in Acorn, a uh, dying B movie director gets one last chance to make a movie that uh, she hopes will be autobiographical. Uh, it does not go well. Uh, while she's making her movie, a documentarian is following her around. So we have uh, at least two layers of narrative there. Three, if you consider the autobiographical nature of the movie that our director is trying to make. All of these sort of um, movies begin to sort of blend into each other and through them grows this weird magical man-eating tree. It makes sense, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> because I was watching it, and I was like, at first I was like, because I didn't watch the, the documentary first. I actually watched the movie, and I was like, okay, this is an interesting story. This is about, like, a Western. Okay, this is a the monster. I was like, oh, this is interesting. And then, like, it shoots over to something else, and then something else. I was like, oh, where is this going? And then... But it's, it's a fascinating story. It's definitely something new and something I haven't seen anything like this. So, I mean, what gave you inspiration to create this project? Right. I mean, movies that are self-reflective, you know, sort of uh, movies about movies. Uh, there's there, there there's lots of those. Uh, uh, State and Maine. Um, uh, what's another movie about a movie? One of the uh, uh, Wes Craven's uh, New Nightmare, right? Isn't that a yes. movie about a movie? Um, mm -hmm. uh, found footage movies are, in a way, always about themselves. So, you know, a, a movie that reflects on its own form is not a new thing. Um, I do love sort of uh, talking about filmmaking in the movies that I make because I love filmmaking. Um, and uh, Acorn was an opportunity to sort of um, bake that meta narrative into uh, the story um, by way of our main character, right? If she's a dying filmmaker who wants to say something about her own life in her last movie uh, and is constantly frustrated just by the process of making a movie, which is hard under any circumstances, but especially hard when you're dying. Um, but she has the benefit of being surrounded by other story storytellers, including a documentarian. And, and so the, the thing she's making, the thing that he's making, um, kind of merge into one uh, er project, er film. Uh, it's, it, and it's, it's meant to, it, the, the, the sort of layers of meta narrative. God, I know how boring this sounds when I talk about it, but trust me, it's, <laughs> it's not boring. It's like struggling working class filmmakers trying to slap latex onto underpaid actors and, you know, um, shooting action sequences with laser pointers standing in for laser guns and things like that. But anyway, uh, these, the, these layers of meta -narr narrative begin to blur into each other because, uh, you know, that one of the points is that, all of these movies are bigger than their creators and they all have uh, live, the movies themselves have lives of their own. And in Acorn, the, 
movies that our, our, our hero filmmakers are trying to make begin to take on, um, uh, begin to do their own thing. <laughs> they sort of make their own choices. And uh, uh, the monster tree that grows through the firmament of all of these layers of storytelling is sort of the embodiment of that uh, of those movies taken life. Wow, that yes. that but, uh, is an <laughs> awful synopsis of this movie. <laughs> but what I was saying was uh, uh, about like it's something different because I mean this movie is definitely a song for indie filmmakers. I mean, I'm going to say break it down mm -hmm. to indie horror filmmakers, and and I haven't seen a movie that is almost like a little song. It's a there's a little nips and bits and pieces in there that indie filmmakers would understand and get. I really hope so. Yeah, we, I we, definitely uh, agree, yeah. <laughs> we kind of lost our minds making this thing because it, 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 uh, it was uh, from every, uh, on, at, at every level of production from scripting to shooting to editing, it was a bewildering process that was always sort of struggling to break free. The movie was always struggling to break free free of the constraints that we tried to impose on it. Um, and then in an act of utter madness, we decided to make a documentary about the faux documentary about a movie, about a movie about itself. So we heaped an entire additional layer of narrative on top of the actual film by making a documentary about the film. So yeah, we've completely lost it. <laughs> Because I'm going to shoot over to the uh, documentary right next, which is Create or Die, and that was directed by Sarah. Now, I had the pleasure of watching that as well, and it definitely, I got to see the mindset and, you know, we're indie filmmakers. I've never made a mm -hmm. film before. I would love to make a film. I never made one before, but I it, it got to go into the minds and give some the audience who are not filmmakers a little bit about what the process of an indie filmmaker looks like. So, so how was it filming this project for you, Sarah? Oh, for me. Yes. Um, yeah, I think the documentary for me was a personal message as much as it was a story about the making of Acorn. Um, during my entire career, you know, I've always, run into people who are like, oh, uh, I, I don't understand why so-and-so wants to be an actor, do that actor thing. Like, why do you want to be a filmmaker? Like, why not just, you know, get a normal desk job like everybody else? And, um, you know, I've always felt within myself, well, you know, I have this passion within me. I have this drive to create, and it's something innate. It's something that, you know, it's just as much part of me as like my personality. Um, and I am part of a community here in Augusta, Georgia of indie filmmakers and, and David's part of the indie filmmaker world in Columbia, where we're making productions on extremely shoestring budgets and we're putting in long hours and a lot of time to create something that hopefully people will want to watch. Um, you know, we all believe in our own personal projects, but obviously sometimes, you know, they're they're not going to take off and get a large audience, but we keep doing it. We keep hoping, we keep trying, we keep working at it. I know a lot of people who have full-time uh, day jobs and they spend all of their free time trying to make films. And I really, really wanted, it, wanted to explore that drive, both the drive that I have and the drive that others around me have to create despite the odds. And so I actually met David at a screening for Acorn. So um, I'd never met him before. Um, I was a friend of a gentleman who uh, both acted in and was on set for Acorn. And uh, we were both extras in another project. And he was telling me about David. And he was like, hey, we're having a screening. You want to come see it? And I'm like, I, I don't even know if this movie's going to be good. Like, I, I went in with zero <laughs> expectations whatsoever. And I think what I really liked about Acorn off the bat was how honest it was. It wasn't trying to be something it wasn't. Um, 
but it had very real, raw emotions to it. Um, I have a family member who went through a cancer journey and beat their cancer, but the emotions that the main character feels when, you know, as a filmmaker, she finds out, you know, life is finite and she only has time to make one more movie. I could understand those feelings. They were very real. And the struggles and things that went wrong during production actually if you watch the documentary creator die you'll find out that some of the same things that david wrote into the script actually happened to them in real life and um so that's how i first got to know him and i, I watched the movie and i was like wow there there's just something very real about the emotions here that i really really like and also like david's very honest almost uh downplays his work to a certain extent and i appreciate it that kind of lack of ego because you know we're just working with what we got um and it's a learning process and i respect you know humility and artists who also are able to like capture like those raw emotions in their movies and um so yeah, I was just, I was so fascinated by the story. And then I got to know him and some of the actors who were involved in the movie. And they all start telling me the behind the scenes stories of Acorn. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like almost the making of this movie was just as interesting as the movie itself. And so yeah, it was uh, April of last year when David comes up to me and he's like, oh my gosh, Sarah, I have a really bad idea. He's like, what if we made a documentary about an acorn? Essentially a documentary about a documentary about a movie. And I was like, heck yeah. I have been waiting for an opportunity because I've made docu shorts, but I've never made a feature length documentary. So I jumped to the chance. He was like, listen, like you can tell whatever story you want to tell. If you want to make us look bad, if it's entertaining, that's, you know, that's the only important thing. Just make it interesting. And I'm like, okay, well, I got to find the story. Um, and we were actually just going into production for a feature film. And his distributor comes back and they're like, sure, fine. Well, we'll, you know, be interested in a documentary. But slight plot twist, you have to get the entire thing done in three months. And we were going into production for a new feature film. And I was um, cinematographer for that. So... Oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> this documentary was made <laughs> in three months flat <laughs> wow. for better or for worse. <laughs> and, and it, it's, it's an eye opening experience. Even, you know, I've been doing this for a year interviewing indie filmmakers and it's just an eye opening experience. But, you know, it talks about the struggles of indie filmmakers mm -hmm. and quote unquote bad film <laughs> filmmakers and also talks about also to the struggles that a lot of filmmakers don't get their projects made, and a lot and a lot of indie filmmakers, you know, crowdfunding or um, don't go through are not successful. Mm -hmm. So, what are are these some real experiences that the, the both of you have experienced with indie filmmaking, Sarah? I uh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I do several people, David included, who are writers and have gone through the experience or are currently going through the experience of trying to um, sell their scripts to production companies and get people who are interested in them simply because uh, I know one person I know, um, you know, it's just it's very hard to raise the budget to actually film a feature film. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard even to even to write a script to get a feature film script completed is difficult and then you know raising the money finding the locations getting that the cast and crew it's it's quite the challenge i you know hats off to anybody who even gets a feature film done um i don't even care what the quality is if you've if you've completed a feature film i mean that that is an achievement in and of itself yeah, I, I totally agree. Just making anything is extremely difficult. Uh, and if your ambition is to start from nowhere and uh, make, you know, a write, produce, direct, act in, whatever. If your ambition is to start from nowhere and make a big studio movie, then the odds are extremely long. 
And I think you should ask yourself also what makes you think you're qualified to <laughs> to to make something that big. Uh, my, uh, I mean, I'm I'm a worker. My attitude has always been. Uh, if you want, if you aspire to do something well, start doing it and do it on a small scale frequently. And in the beginning, do it badly. Um, because in the beginning, you just need to learn. Uh, so make whatever you can make uh, as often as you can and be humble and be tough and be focused on learning so that whatever it is you're aspiring to becomes increasingly possible as you gain experience and hopefully credibility. Um, I like to think that we're on that journey. My, I, something I talk about explicitly in Create or Die, Sarah's documentary, which is my life's ambition is to make one really good movie. <laughs> and I I know who I am and what I am, and I know what it'll take to get there, which is a lot of bad movies. Uh, again, bad. I mean, some people enjoy my little movies, and that's, that's fine. Um, but anyway, to make a lot of small movies uh, as we climb that mountain toward our peak, which will be the one good one that, that I at least aspire to make uh, sometime in the next 40 years. <laughs> well, David, I think, I think you've already made it with Acorn. Acorn. I'm, saying, I'm telling you, I actually enjoyed Acorn. I mean, I was like, I didn't know what to expect going in. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was something different. And especially right now when it comes to big, um, major feature films and even indie, it's a repetitive thing going on because I mean, there's no new fresh ideas. I definitely think this is something fresh and new. Oh, well, I appreciate that. I, I, I still think we are riffing on a lot of existing ideas and definitely playing with existing genres and sort of mashing them together. You know, the, the movie that our hero Chloe wants to make is a Western with fantasy elements that's been done. Um, but you know, the, the movie about making a movie grows into the movie that they make uh, while being wrapped in the container of a documentary about her making a movie. And then, of course, we made the documentary about that documentary about a movie about a movie. So anyway, um, you know, we're, we're pouring a bunch of tropes and genres and stories that we all are super familiar with and love and um, pouring them all into the same into the same pot and stirring them around. Uh, what what really matters to hold together all of these this stew of story elements and genre is the characters and um, and you know and the theme that grows out of what they want and what stands in the way of them getting what they want. Uh, this is fundamentally a movie about people who just want to make movies even if it kills them. Uh, and it kind of does <laughs> in Acorn. Um, I think that's something that, uh, hopefully something that, that all of us here and, and your audience can, can appreciate. Uh, you know, you're, you're a horror critic. This is the genre for self-starters, for people who just fucking love movies, however bad, yeah. however small, as long as yes. it's got heart and... As long as it's there's there, are, you can tell that people really wanted to make this thing because they love the thing. It's not cynical. It's not a cash grab. You know yes. the 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 working class filmmakers who make shitty little horror movies are are real filmmakers because they're not doing it for clout or wealth or fame. They're doing it because they love shitty little horror movies. So that's, <laughs> you know, that's, those are the people I, I hope that we're talking to. <laughs> All right. So, so I have a question off of that. I'm going to ask Sarah first and to David, I'm going to ask you the same question. So when it comes to, so there's an influx of new, especially horror indie filmmakers coming out because, you know, it's a lot accessible to make movies now. Now, do you think a lot of new indie horror filmmakers fail because their expectations through the gate are so high or, I don't want to say delusional, but like, do you think they, that they think, oh my goodness, I have to make a million dollars off my first film and 
it has to get X amount of views. It has to get picked up by HBO Max. Yeah, I think um, for people getting started in filmmaking who are on the indie level, it's really, really important to manage your expectations for what you can do and where you can go. Um, I think for us, like even with the budgets we tend to work with are a little bit larger than some people we know uh, can raise. But even with that, you know, you'd be surprised at how quickly you run out of money on set. Um, so you have to you have to balance that. I mean, like we, you know, you, you watch horror movies that are blockbusters or even indie films that are made with like several million dollar budgets. And you're like, oh, that's cool. Let me go in my backyard and make that. But you can't afford the equipment. You can't afford the lights. You've got to figure out where you want to put your money. Most important thing is to feed your cast and crew. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think I think people going into it can. Um, have their momentum damaged if they think, oh, I'm going to make something really, really good. And then they make something and they're like, oh, this, this is garbage. Um, I say, okay, well then complete it and then try again. But it's hard when you see like the image in your mind and you just can't quite create it because of budget constraints and that kind of thing. So you need to learn to be like a very flexible person um, and also understand that you're not doing this for fame and glory and money You've got to put heart and soul into it. And honestly, those are the movies that resonate with audiences the most, the ones that they can emotionally connect with. So if you're doing it from kind of a marketing perspective, I'm making a movie just because I want to get to this goal and you forget to tell the story, you forget to put the heart and the soul into it, that's actually going to hurt it um, with the audience. So it's really important to like be honest about what you're making and tell your story to the best of the ability. Story comes first, even if you know you don't have the money for a big crew or all of the technical equipment. Uh, yeah, I I one hundred percent agree. Uh, also, I would, um, in my own experience, I would say the process of making movies from scratch with almost nothing has uh, awakened me to the potential of filmmaking. So what do I mean by that? Um, I think Kurosawa said it as he was in his 80s and dying that he he lamented that only now in his old age with all of with his career behind him did he fully appreciate what uh, what what a movie could be and Spielberg recently echoed that by saying you know here I am in my 70s way more movies behind me than I have ahead of me and I regret only that or was it Scorsese who said it anyway somebody did <laughs> that uh, I know it's Scorsese uh, that I, I I only regret that um, that it took me this long to appreciate what a movie could do and now it's too late to do it. So um, for myself, how that applies, the first movie that my former collaborator, Chris Bickle and I made in 2016, uh, The Theta Girl, just seeing the first scene that Chris cut together, which was like a driving scene with um, simple camera POV from the point of view of the driver looking out on the road, road sweeps past as the car drives and he cut it together with some interior shots of the car and some dialogue and put a little music under it and colored it. And it was like 720p. It was like low res and everything, super cheap, digital, terrible lighting. But just seeing that we had cut a scene that we, it was the first time I saw something that, that I had made, um, in the in the shape of a movie in the the look and cut and sound and color of a movie it looked like a movie it was one little stupid simple scene that we could shoot in an hour now but it 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 changed my life seeing that 30 seconds of road sweeping past and you know a couple characters talking in a car because all of a sudden i realized um i mean i knew what a movie was i've watched thousands of movies but suddenly I understood people make movies and I can make them too. Uh, and with each movie I've made for better or for worse, uh, I um, have appreciated more fully uh, 
what a movie can do um, given the right story, given the right crew, given the right actors, given the right process and the right technology and the patience and the creativity that turns, you know, a moving a digital image, uh, 24 digital images per second into a scene that's part of an act that's part of a movie. Um, all that is to say, uh, the, the more I make movies, the grander my ambitions become. It's no longer enough just to shoot something. I want to shoot something really, really good. Uh, the, so you ask, does, can an, a, a, a filmmaker's ambition to make something great from the outset deter them from making anything? Sure. But that's not at all the philosophy I have. Um, my ambition has always been to make to make a good movie, but I 100% understand that you make that one movie at a time, one worse movie at a time. Um, and with each one, your, your skill and appreciation of the art will grow. Um, and it's only through making them that you can fully appreciate what that thing is that you aspire to and gradually become capable of it. Uh, I mean, Sarah and I, just in editing our last movie, Left One Alive, which we're still editing, um, have learned so much about, about scripting, about shooting, about color, um, sound mixing. Uh, and we're constantly struggling to catch up with what we learn. So like Sarah had to learn Da Vinci to color better, right? I approached the sound mix in a, in a completely different way where I began to pare the sound mix down to like to really understand what, what needs to be in a sound mix to make the sound mix work, to keep it as simple and clean as possible in order to make it actually sound and feel richer and denser and more real. Less is more. It, so we're learning these things as we're cutting this movie and then trying to adjust our cut to what we just learned. So it's like, it's this incredible process of learning on the job. But we had to give ourselves the job in order to have the opportunity to learn, which is what I keep saying over and over again, right? I just want to make movies until I make the one. I mean, what I, what I, the, the secret that I'm going to go ahead and say is that I know there is no one. I mean, I'll just keel over dead at some point having never made the one, uh, but you tell yourself there's the one. No, no filmmaker actually believes they've made one perfect movie. No, they all just aspire and try and strive and learn and grow and fail and get back up and try again until they die. And that's what we're doing here. But the one is just <laughs> our religion, right? It's that thing that we sort of it's bow down to. And, yeah, motivation. Yeah, I so, think... So um, what? Sorry, sir. Oh, I was going to say, uh, I think for me, like, one of the most important things is every single production I do, I always say I have to walk away with something that I've learned. Um, I, I can never walk out of a production and be like, all right, I'm exactly where I was. I have to walk away with, you know, a list of things that's like, all right, the next production, I will be better. And in that regard, like, even with Create or Die, I'm like, already, I know things that I need to work on. But I, I consider that to be a success because it means the next, like every production gets me to the next one. So that's, it's almost the beauty of the process. You know, if you're, if you're refusing to be happy until you get to, you know, that perfect movie, then, you know, everyone's career. I mean, even the, the greats, um, the directors out in Hollywood, you know, they get into their 80s and they're like, oh yeah, that, like I have so much more to learn. And so I think that's what you have to settle into as an artist of any type, as an actor, as a film director, as a writer, is that it's all part of the journey. And you're going to, you are like clay and you will continue to be molded throughout your career. But also something that I think is really important is um, a lot of people on the indie or beginner level um, 
will have kind of like a cookie cutter image of what they need to make. And I think it's really important, especially when you're working within budget constraints and resource constraints to think outside the box. I mean, David and I love to sit around and talk about how to create more engaging camera angles, how to get the camera moving, how to create oneers, how to make things interesting instead of, you know, shooting the way every single other cinematographer shoots. So, you know, even if you do have that budgetary constraint, um, it's important to try to think outside of the box within that. And I think it can be a nice challenge. Um, even, you know, when we went to see uh, Poor Things and they're using extreme fish eye lenses and it's like that's shocking i you know like you would think that that would be like a great rule of don't use fisheye for cine <laughs> cinematic films but that's a great example of being like hey i got a fisheye lens i want to go shoot something now and so we always try to challenge ourselves like how can we use the resources we have to create something authentic and real and emotional within those limitations and I, I'm telling you, so I'm a brand new YouTube creator, and I've never done anything like this podcast. Like, you know, I'm barely a year in, and 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 one thing about the movie, it it hit at home with me, like because when I jumped on, I did not do any computer classes about editing or anything. It was literally me just jumping on, figuring the shit out. <laughs> and if you watch my earlier videos, it looks like that. But like it's right now, it's this is still a learning experience for me. Like even something as simple as keeping the mic right here and don't lean back because the audience can't hear you. Put the light. This every single video is a learning experience for me because it, this was something I didn't take a class on. I didn't. I didn't do any research on. I was like, this is something I want to do. I'm just going to jump in. And I'm going to figure the shit out over time. Yep, yeah. that's the way to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think, like, I know some people who are filmmakers and they love filmmaking, but, you know, they didn't have the opportunity or the money or the chance to go to film school when they were younger. And I think that's something important. Like, if you're okay with failing and getting up and trying again and continually learning through each production, um, you can essentially put yourself through that school. It's going to be a lot of hard work, but, you know, the resources are out there. Um, there's plenty of YouTube channels, books that you can read, videos that you can watch that'll explain to you how to do things. And, you know, like David said, like even the productions we're doing now, like we keep increasing our knowledge on, you know, the technical side and the artistic side. Um, but yeah, you just got to be willing to go out there and do it. But anybody can get started. Yeah. And like David said in the, um, in the documentary, you can go through a lot of embarrassments. Now, how important is it to be, as an indie filmmaker or a creator, how important is it to be thick-skinned and not easily offended? Uh, it, that is extremely important. Uh, the, uh, the critical world audiences can be cruel, uh, but also sometimes they're just honest. Um, not everyone's going to like your movie. Some people are going to dislike it for good reasons. Some are going to dislike it for bad reasons. Uh, you're going to hear more from the folks who don't like your movies than you are from the folks who do, because if people watch a movie and like it, they're usually just happy and they don't need to go on the internet and scream about it. But um, anger motivates more than you know contentedness does. So you'll hear more from your your bad uh, response. You're from your critics, and you will from your your boosters. Um, and if you take every comment, every bad review uh, as some kind of personal attack or as gospel, um, then yeah, it'll, it'll it could could bring your entire career to a screeching halt. It can also turn into a giant waste of time if you choose to engage with these folks. Don't engage. Oh, yeah. um, the The right approach for an indie filmmaker is make your movie uh, in a way that makes you happy. Do your best to make a movie you want to see. Kick it out there to the world. Some people will like it. A lot of people won't. Um, if you choose to read the comments, 
look for the constructive ones and take them to heart. Ignore the rest and and move on. But also be aware that like, so, I mean, thousands and thousands of movies get released in the United States every year. And most of them, no one says anything at all about negative or positive. Uh, so if anyone is saying anything about your movie, that's actually a good thing. It means that someone's watching it and there is some awareness that your movie exists. So take even the bad press as good press because it's some press. Uh, Sarah and I, our attitude is all press is good press and negative reviews are good reviews. Uh, the risk to a tiny movie is not that it gets bad reviews. It's that no one notices it at all. And Sarah? What was the question? Sorry. Oh, um, how important is it to be thick skin? Ah, uh, that's right. Um, yes, um, I definitely agree. Um, I think it's really important to know, also be able to discern what advice uh, you should take and which advice you should, you know, respectfully disagree with. Um, you know, especially getting started. Yeah, I've had people come up to me and be like, oh, you know, you should be using more close-up shots in your cinematography. And then somebody else turns around and goes, oh, you should, you, you're really not doing enough wide angles. And I'm like, well, I can't do both. Like, you know, it, it's really important to understand which advice to take and which advice to be like, hey, well, that's, you know, respectfully your personal opinion. And, you know, people, people are going to find things that they don't like about your movies and other somebody else. It's going to, it's going to resonate with them. And, you know, like David was saying, like, you know, I mean, you learn this with like Amazon reviews, like people are going to go and leave reviews if they don't like something. If you like something, then you're probably not going to think about leaving a review. So the reviews that you hear, you know, the negative reviews, as far as your movies, um, you're probably going to hear more of those than the positive. But I, ju I just think it's really important to stay honest with who you are. Um, if you're if you're making something that's not true to you, um, you know, don't don't get to that place where you're only making content that you think people want to watch and it's not really coming from your heart. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really important to stay honest to yourself. And if you feel that it's good within you, you know, with a healthy ego, um, then, you know, negativity is going to come. That's fine. Treat every project as a learning process. So learn something for the next project and you'll get better. And, you know, if you stay faithful to that, people are going to recognize, you know, hey, maybe your first movie wasn't a smash success. Maybe they didn't like it. But they're certainly going to, you know, give you the credit for trying hard and, continuing to do what you love to do what do you have to say to filmmakers who don't grow over time sarah do we know any filmmakers who aren't growing <laughs> <laughs> don't name them yeah no um but no this is like one of our pet peeves of seeing you know people who continually make the same mistake over and over and, you know, don't challenge themselves, don't work on, you know, um, growing their craft. Um, I, I, I think that's so important um, to a long term career. I mean, I, some people have found their niche, you know, good for them. Good for them if they have an audience. I, you know, I've seen filmmakers who have quite a supportive audience doing what they do and you know if that if that brings them joy that's great but i know certainly for david and i we're never content with what we've done we always want to we always want to make it better learn from it grow um do something you know different shake things up a little bit so you know we'll, we'll certainly never settle ourselves yeah, I would say if if you are not if if as a filmmaker you aren't constantly desperate to to get better or to find it to very at the very least find new ways of doing things, then you don't love your craft. Uh, it also tells me that you're not watching a lot of movies, which is one of my pet mm. peeves as filmmakers who don't watch movies, <laughs> which and they exist. It's crazy, but they're not they're not seeing what uh, you know what 
they're not engaged in the conversation, the sort of culture wide conversation through film. They're not seeing what people are shooting and how people are shooting and how people are bouncing ideas off of each other and what's engaging with audiences and what isn't. Um, if you're not watching movies, you're not in that conversation and you're not keeping up with the state of the art, frankly. And so, yeah, if you don't, if you're content with where you are, it means you're, you don't care and you're not engaged. Mm hmm all right, David, where can everyone find you? Uh, I'm on the website formerly known as Twitter uh, under at D-A-X-E. That's D -A -X -E. I'm on Facebook under my name, David Axe. You can find our movies Acorn and Create or Die on various VOD platforms. It'll be rolling out. Both will be rolling out to more and more platforms over the next few weeks. Uh, Amazon, Tubi, Vudu, uh, iTunes, etc. Um, there will be Blu-rays and DVDs for Acorn, not for Creator Die. Um, you know, just um, remember our names, David Axe and Sarah Massey, and you will find the stuff we make. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And Sarah, is there anything you like to say? Um, to add, sorry, I didn't catch that. <laughs> No, I would say, is there anything you want to add? Any social media you can be found on? Yes. Uh, all the social medias, just search Sarah Massey or my username, Papillon underscore Deloon, which, yeah, you might want to type that out. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, people are always like, what's, what's your Instagram? I'm like, I'll, I'll just type it for you. Um, <laughs> But yeah, um, yeah, all the social medias, uh, and I think David said uh, Creator Die is currently on Zumo, and will be on Amazon Prime and Tubi. Sweet. Listen, everyone, please check out Acorn and Creator Die. They're a fun ride. I'm giving them two thumbs up, by the way. Aww. Check them <laughs> out. David, thanks for coming back on. Sarah, it's been a blast having you on as well. It was lovely meeting you, Travis. Thanks, Travis. <laughs> All right, everyone, well, thank you for coming to the Horror Room. I'm mm -hmm. Travis Bruce. I'll see you guys next time. Take care.